Hello, everybody. My name is Arlene, and I'm substituting for Rebecca Berman tonight. She had a, another commitment, but she'll be back next week. Uh, for those of you who have missed coming to tonight's meeting, certainly you can pull this up on YouTube any day this week. Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn served as epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology forecasting and advanced analytics with Bristol-Myers Squibb, Sanofi, Novartis, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military Health Service, CDC, and other programs in the United States and abroad. All views expressed today are his own. So, Glenn, maybe we can start, if you can please update us on the COVID-19 pandemic variants of concern and vaccination in the US and abroad. Thank you so much for the introduction and let me share my screen. Okay, so here is what we are, are looking at. Um, let me move this so I can see it. So this is from the CDC's website on uh, the um, blue are the total cases that were diagnosed. Red is the moving average. And yellow that you see here are the deaths. Basically, we had three surges so far. The big one last fall, winter, or I guess it was the end. So it was uh, March that happened. So it was the end, it was springtime that this surge hit. Um, we had this summer surge that was mostly in the South that got hit. Then we had this big surge. Um, back in March, April, or rather fall uh, and winter of this past year, this past season, and now we're going down. So we're, we're uh, definitely following the seasonal patterns, at least for the first and the second one. This, the, it was odd last summer uh, that we had that second surge in the South. Um, we do think after a lot of uh, analyses that have taken place, looking at the, the uh, behavior of the virus globally, uh, it does appear to strongly be a seasonal disease, uh, similar to cold and flu season, uh, and in particular, pneumonia uh, season. So um, we're expecting that the summer is the best time. Generally, it's, it was odd that we had uh, those cases in the South uh, last summer. So we are going to be looking out for that again. So that was back in like mid to late June that we started seeing those cases rising. Um, in the South. So we're gonna be looking for that to see if there's anything there, particularly with this new variant of concern we've been talking about, the B1617.2. Um, and then, uh, but, but again, a lot of epidemiologists are fully expecting that come fall and winter of this coming year, we're going to have another surge, uh, perhaps even bigger than the one we just had because of the B617.2 variant. Again, as a refresher, um, the original variant came from Wuhan, China, and that uh, created a lot of different variants. Over time, the UK variant emerged, this B117, and that was found to be around 70% more contagious than the original variant. Um, and now this new one, B1617.2 has emerged, and this is found to be 50% more contagious than the UK variant. So 50% on top of the 70% more contagious. So I'll show you some of the graphs uh, soon, but this is uh, going to hit almost everyone. Um, so either people are gonna be vaccinated this fall and winter, or they're very likely to get it if they're unvaccinated. It's not like anything we've seen before, way, way more contagious. And, um, and so pretty much everyone is gonna get it at this point. Um, so, so everyone needs to get vaccinated ASAP. Um, this, so these are, this is the graphs that we're seeing so far. You see that the cases are coming down a little bit quicker uh, than the deaths. because There's always a delay with the deaths uh, that, that we're seeing uh, by approximately two weeks or so. Um, when you look at the states, so in terms of where the transmission is occurring, you can see that the transmission has fallen in a lot of states. There's a lot of yellow, which is really great. 
Uh, it's summertime, or we're approaching summer. It feels like summer, but it's uh, late, uh, late spring, and we're approaching summer. And so this is really not cold and flu season. And so this is the great time to to be outdoors, be enjoying the outdoors, getting together with friends and family. This is this is the time to really enjoy it. Um, you see that transmission is still pretty low. There are a couple of exceptions. So for instance, here's Colorado and up here is Michigan. These are the two key exceptions. But interestingly, there are still some others. Like, so for instance, when you look over here at Florida or Louisiana, uh, there's still a fair amount of transmission. However, when you look at cases, um, you can see that, um, that Louisiana and Florida, although there's some cases, it's not as much as some up here. Um, Wyoming, Colorado, Michigan, and Maine uh, are the leaders in terms of the cases, but luckily the, they're dropping uh, when you compare them state by state and some of these more than others uh, when, when you look at the transmission. Um, and so this is cases. Um, that's all I really want to look at there. But you can see just as a map, um, the, the next thing is, is the vaccines. So uh, we've, we've kind of stalled in getting adults vaccinated. We are still seeing improvement, but we're not seeing improvement as fast as we'd like. So roughly 85% uh, of people over the age of 65 have gotten at least one vaccine so far, one, sh one dose, and around 74% have been fully vaccinated, which is better than the seasonal flu and other things. But given the uh, severity of this disease, uh, both in terms of morbidity and mortality, um, this is that we need to get this up. 25% of population age 65 and over uh, not having it yet is still a large number of people who are at risk that we're going to be as we go into the next fall and uh, winter season. Um, but when you look at the population over age 18, uh, it's we're really not anywhere where we need anywhere near where we need to be. You see around 50% have been fully vaccinated over the age of 18. Um, we, we are vaccinated more are vaccinating more of the people over the age of 12. Um, but but the, the kids age 12 to 18 are really at very low risk of morbidity and mortality. Uh, and what we found over the last year is that they tend not to spread it very much. So even if they get infected, not only are their symptoms less severe, but they also tend to, to spread it way, way less. Um, and so we really need to get the adults uh, vaccinated. We, we have a few months. This is our last chance going into next fall and winter. Uh, I think that this coming fall and winter so far uh, from just what I can, what I'm, what I'm perceiving is that this is going to be the last big one. I think once we get through the next fall and winter, um, I think that after that, we're really going to have almost everyone around the world will have either been infected or vaccinated at that point. The vast majority will at that point. And so even though it will be endemic and it'll still be circulating after that, it won't be pandemic and we won't see these big that we've been seeing for the last year and, and, and a half almost. Um, all right, so here's what we're looking for vaccines. When you look down here in terms of the pop percentages, uh, you see that there's wide variation across the country. So you see in the Northeast, uh, Northeast is doing a pretty good job of vaccinating people. Um, so that as the percentage that's totally vaccinated over age 18, um, you can see that in New Jersey, it's around 60%. Uh, so, some are 61, let's, let's look at 63, um, 63, so that's good. However, in much of the South, it's not very good. Over here, we're looking at, so 44% in Texas, 43% uh, Oklahoma, we're in the high 30% in some of these Southern states, um, approaching 40%. But so there's a, a vast disparity here in terms of the South. So the South, 40% fully vaccinated, versus the Northeast, we're looking at 50, 60, uh, approaching 70% or, or high 60s, let's say, mid 60s. Um, and so this is going to have a real impact uh, with this uh, B1617.2 variant. As, as this starts hitting more uh, come fall and winter of this coming year, um, this, this is the chance and the South is not preparing well. So we're, we're going to see the, the morbidity and mortality over the next uh, six to 12 months over there. Okay, these are vaccines. Um, this is the United States. Let's look globally. Um, so at a glance, these are the total cases. This is where things are happening now. We do see the seasonality effect globally. And so even though there were some really big cases uh, that were happening in Europe and Asia, 
those are, are on their way down now. Uh, so across the board, um, there you can see that they're on their way down. Um, some some countries are higher than others. I mean, look at Sweden; it's still quite high relative to some of these others, but um, but but they're on their way down because, uh, and that's again largely driven by the seasonality. There's other policies in place and other things going on, but seasonality is so critical for this. It's where we've left cold and flu season for the most part. Um, in contrast. Uh, in, you, India is coming down too, and I, I'll show the graph in a second. But in contrast, now we are heading into cold and flu season for the Southern Hemisphere. So I, I mentioned around this time last year um, that all eyes were on the Southern Hemisphere because it's winter time when it's summertime up here. And so how the South, how South America did in their winter was going to be a forecast for how we would do in our winter. And as you can see, this is the second year that that we're sort of going into cold and flu season or, or co with COVID-19 uh, in the southern hemisphere and they are starting to get hit really hard. Brazil has been really tough uh, for a while now like I, I called out South America in general. So if you look over here Brazil has been it got hit pretty hard the, uh, the first surge and then it was starting to go down then there was the P1 variant that emerged in Brazil, and now other variants have emerged there as well. And it's just been bad for months and months there. Um, high morbidity and mortality rates, collapse of some healthcare systems where they've run out of oxygen, um, and really terrible situations. They're really, I, I was uh, telling someone earlier today, in the United States, we mostly avoided these nightmare scenes where it was scenes of people dying in hallways or, or whatnot. But in other parts of the world, including Brazil and, and in particular India, there are nightmare scenes that people are saying, what you might expect from a movie about a, an, a pandemic. So for instance, in India, there have been um, bodies washing up on the side of rivers just because there are so many dead bodies, they don't know what to do with them. Massive <laughs> fires to burn and try to get rid of the bodies and stuff. Collapse of healthcare systems, running out of oxygen. Uh, can you imagine? not going, bringing a loved one to the hospital because they have COVID-19 and they don't even have oxygen to give the people. And so at that point, it's a, a collapse of the healthcare system and, and there's not much that the healthcare can do to help stop things. Luckily, when you look at India, uh, India is doing a lot better, or not a lot better, they're, they're in a good direction now. Um, let me get rid of Seychelles. So that, Seychelles, I'll just talk before I get rid of it. We talked about that last week, how they, they were rising and it's such a crazy manner, um, largely because of some of these India variants, probably, almost, or, or I would say almost certainly, but not necessarily because of the B1617.2. I don't know exactly what's driving it, but um, but it was likely a variant uh, that, that that was the variant that was driving it. Um, and so Seychelles, luckily, over the last week or two, um, has started, or over the last few days, has started to come down. Uh, so they reached their peak and they're going down. Again, with um, Seychelles, they're, uh, I think, number one in the world in vaccination. Uh, so over 60% had been completely vaccinated, over 70% had gotten at least one vaccine. And yet, despite all of those people vaccinated, we still saw the scene of, of Seychelles getting hit this hard. And that's why we expect this is gonna be a really hard winter in South America, because this new variant is gonna come in and, and infect people who were not previously infected over the last year uh, in, in South America. When you look at what's going on there now, um, you can see that I said was saying Brazil was, has been bad, but a lot of other countries are starting on their upward uh, trend now. We don't know how bad it's going to get, but this is just the beginning of their cold and flu season, just the beginning of their seasonal COVID-19 now. And so a lot of these that you see that are going up, um, this is just the beginning of the season. Here's, our, here, here's Argentina already, um, just at the beginning of their season and, and they're, they're uh, not going in, in good shape. Um, so things are gonna get pretty rough there pretty quickly. Um, anyway, so this is South America. Um, when you look at some of the other uh, vaccines, whoops. All right, well here, let me start up here. All right, so here is um, the countries that have, the, the percentage of the populations in some of these countries who have received at least one vaccine. So Seychelles is leaving the, um, uh, the pack. Israel is at 63% or so. Mongolia is, is, is 56%. Uh, United Kingdom is also up there at 56%. Other parts of Europe here, we have Hungary at 52%. Uh, 
Uh, Bahrain is at 52%. They've been uh, great for a while. Let me see if I can read it. Um, you can see that there, that the there, there have, uh, Israel has been higher longer as well as Seychelles, but that some are coming up. So, for instance, United Kingdom, uh, not the United Kingdom. That's what is this? This is Mongolia that that's been vaccinating so fast, so uh, so recently. Um, but so so anyway, there's there's been some real big increases. I'm not going to get through some more. Europe, Europe, uh, as a reminder. Uh, went through uh, really working to give one dose first. And then uh, United States, in contrast, um, was really focusing on giving two doses as quick as possible. The reasoning being in Europe that uh, if you could do one dose first, that that would give you, that would enable you to vaccinate more people more rapidly. Uh, even if it wasn't a perfect protection, at least there'd be some amount of protection for a larger number of people. Um, but now that we've hit summer, uh, we really need to get everyone their second doses. Um, and so that's coming. All right. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say for that for globally. Uh, we talked about South America. We talked about vaccines, uh, what's being hit. Um, I can look at, so we can just go through some of the countries. At a high level here, um, you can see there's three basic ways of looking at globally at the countries. According to this website, this is the ncoronavirus.org that I've looked at some over the last year. Um, red are the ones that are in pretty bad shape. Yellow are getting better and green uh, are in great shape. And you can see over the last few weeks, lar again, largely due to the seasonality of this. The, the, the policies almost are less relevant. It's the seasonality that's really driving this for across almost across the board. Um, you see this really sharp drop in these countries that's starting to occur, which is great. Um, but when you go to the red ones, you can see that some countries are not doing as well. So for instance, here's Vietnam. Um, look at that sharp rise that we're seeing. Um, you see in the Southern hemisphere, we started talking about this, that Uruguay was starting to go up. Um, here's Venezuela that's going up a little bit. Look at this, uh, Timor-Leste, Trinidad and Tobago. Some of these are going straight up. Taiwan was doing really well for much of the year, but now it's, it's kind of uh, starting to increase uh, pretty rapidly. And so they're in bad shape. Here's Sri Lanka. Uh, some others are starting to come down. They're going in a good direction, um, but but we're not anywhere out of the woods. I, I know a lot of people in the United States um, over the last couple of weeks, now that we could take our masks off, if you were vaccinated, a lot of people have thought, okay, well, now it's time to burn the masks. We're, we're done. Let's We're done with the whole epidemic in the United States because we're, we can take the masks off. And I think a lot of people are not perceiving that it's not cold and flu season anymore. It's not COVID-19 season. Summer is here, but as soon as cold and flu season and COVID-19 season comes back in the fall and winter, we are going to need to put those masks right back on. Um, and so, and as a, as a way of just looking at this, I mean, this is not just like uh, just random speculation. When we look, this is a global pandemic. And when we look at the Southern hemisphere, you can see uh, that, that their winter is coming and, and they are in, in bad shape. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I said enough about that. Here's Costa Rica, Chile is going up. Brazil has been bad for a while. They're still going up, um, which is surprising because you'd think that how could they continue going up at this point? The fact that they've been uh, reinfected already. It's a lot of people that have been reinfected. How can they continue going up? Well, they're still going up. Um, anyway, here's, here's Argentina that we talked about. Um, they're, they're not in good shape. So, so this is what we're gonna be keeping an eye on. Um, one thing that we had talked about, we'll mention it at the end as well, um, uh, if you could just remind me, is that going into the summer, just to respect people's ca uh, calendars and schedules, I think we're going to start switching to an every other weekend uh, platform. This coming weekend is Memorial Day weekend, so we won't, we, we won't meet next weekend. Uh, and then after, after that, every other weekend, we'll plan on, on, uh, on having it hosted one of these. And, and probably the key story we'll be talking about then is the Southern Hemisphere uh, and any new research that comes out and that kind of thing. But basically right now, the um, all, all eyes are on the Southern Hemisphere and, and we're not um, uh, very happy with what we're seeing there right now. All right, Arlene, back to you. Oh, very interesting. Thank you very much, Glenn. Okay, can you please tell us more about the B1617.2 variant? What countries has it hit 
And are vaccines protective against it? Yeah, there's a lot of questions about B1617.2. Uh, we're probably gonna be talking about this one for a while. Although one thing I should add is that um, the fall winter season is still many months away. And the variants that might be of more interest to us then are not necessarily even around yet. They might not have even evolved yet. And so right now B1617.2 is the most serious one that we're looking at simply because it's the most contagious. Uh, and, and so there, it's gonna put a lot of people in the hospital. But at the same time, um, when we're looking at, at, when we're trying to predict what we're gonna see in October, November, December, there could be completely different variants out there that are even more contagious or have some other feature that make them more, uh, more make, make us more alert to them. So for instance, if they have a higher case fatality rate or, or something else is going on, maybe a higher reinfection rate, for instance. Um, but, but right now, B1617.2 B1, is, the, is the key one that we, that we anticipate is gonna be the one that we're gonna be watching out for in fall and winter. All right, so here's the maps where we have what we have so far. The map we're looking at are the dates where these were first identified. Um, so far, they seem to be spreading at roughly the same rate in different countries uh, and in terms of that it's just very contagious wherever it hits. Um, it was first identified in India. We believe that it came out of uh, the, the massive uh, spread that was going on in India, and it's hit a bunch of the countries in that area. It's been in the United States. We talked about this uh, for at least a couple of months now, um, and it's been, uh, it started small, but it's continuing to rise rapidly. There is variation by state, uh, but the data I have access to with the CDC uh, I, I have no new data this week versus what we talked about last week. So I, I won't talk about that in terms of variation by which states are being hit. Um, it's also hit part of, uh, of uh, Europe and you can see the United Kingdom in particular. So I, I do have, they, they've been amazing uh, in terms of sequencing uh, in general. So they've been keeping track. I, I do have some information to share from them. They've also been looking at the vaccine. So I have some information to talk about with that, but uh, the question you asked. Um, so this is the order that they've sort of appeared in terms of uh, the, uh, um, the order of appearance. But um, this map represents largely this map down here. And this is the number of sequence, the, the number of counts of B1617.2. And part of it, though, I, I would take this with a grain of salt. The reason being that uh, the countries are, are uh, sampling the sequences at different rates. And so just because someone has more counts of the sequence does not necessarily mean that there's more of it there. It could just be that they're doing a better job of sequencing versus some of these other countries that we're looking at. But having said that, this is a snapshot of the world where, the sequ where it's been sequenced and it's been found. Um, and so this is what it looks like so far. Having said that, so here's Australia down here. You can see that this is a darker shade of purple, but yet when you look at uh, Australia over here, Australia has virtually no, well, let me get rid of Seychelles. So Australia has virtually no cases. So even though it's found there, um, they've, been extra, they've been doing extraordinarily well of, of keeping COVID-19 low. So even though it's been found, um, it's not a massive epidemic there because of their, their um, policies are still keeping it constrained. Um, all right, there's was, there was a couple other things I wanted to say here. Um, all right, let me just go on to the vaccines. All right, so, uh, well, so here's UK. So in UK, um, there's this organization, Public Health England, um, that's been providing these updates uh, of the variants of concern in the United Kingdom. And, um, and so this is the most recent one. This is from yesterday, May 22nd. And they have some really great information. Um, the first one is this graph. So, so let me just uh, refer, they, they've changed the naming. I guess different people and different organizations are using different names, different designations. In this case, B117, which previously some of us were calling the UK variant, which we really shouldn't, we should be calling it B117. They're calling it variant of concern 20, December 01. So it was first identified 2020, December 1st. So this is B117. That's the first one we're going to be looking at. 
And the second one here that's interesting, and the, the reason that this was so interesting, there's some other variants of concern as well, but this one was most interesting because it was so much more contagious. The other thing that we're, we're at, as well as being so much more severe. The other thing we're looking at here is B1617.2, and this is called variant of concern 21 April 02. All right, so these are the two we're interested in, December 01 and April 02. All right, I'm gonna scroll down. Sorry, I'm scrolling down so fast. The first graph I wanna show you is this one. So B117, again, uh, is this is not here. So we're not looking at B117, but instead what we're looking at that, that's more important is B1617.2. This one's in dark green. And when you look at how much spread the other variants were doing in the United Kingdom, you can see that B1617.2 stands mm -hmm. out as very aggressively spreading within the United Kingdom. It's an exponential curve. Uh, this is the log scale. And so it's, it's just growing very rapidly. Again, United Kingdom, let me, whoops, that's not this one. So let me get rid of some of these others, whoops. All right, I'm gonna get rid of just some, we don't need to, well, I'll keep United States as a reference. I just wanna clean this up a little bit. All right, so here's United Kingdom. So United Kingdom had that last major surge uh, and this was caused by the UK variant that hit um, back in uh, like December. This was, it peaked over the beginning of January. Um, and so this was United Kingdom. The only way they could get this down was um, shutting down the country. Uh, masks, other policies were simply not enough. Uh, and so, they, ha so they, they had to close down much of the country. Um, and, th and that was effective. They were very rapidly able to bring it back down again. Um, right now, you see United Kingdom is doing amazingly well. There's hardly any spread in United Kingdom right now. So that means the fact that we are seeing this kind of spread like right now, despite the fact that United Kingdom has, has virtually no cases and no spread right now, is astonishing. Um, and so that's why a lot of us, this, this coming fall and winter is going to be really, really rough in the Northern Hemisphere. And we're looking now in the Southern Hemisphere to see what's going on in their winter and fall. All right, the other, there's a couple other things here. The biggest one is, I, I pulled it out. Yeah. The biggest one is this. So, so the question has come up about the vaccines. How well do the vaccines protect against B1617.2? And so here's the answer. Um, uh, uh, for the UK variant that, or what I was previously calling the UK variant, now I'm saying we shouldn't be calling, we, we should be calling B117. This one, if you got one dose, it was 50%, roughly 50% protective against severe symptoms, against symptomatic disease, um, or, or symptoms in general, not just, severe, not just severe symptoms. Among people who got two doses, it was roughly 87% protective for the B1, against the B117 variant. All right, in contrast, people who got two doses of, the, um, uh, of any of the vaccines on average against the B1617.2, it's on average 81% protective with the two doses. So that's not too different than the vaccine effectiveness against B117. However, among people who only got one dose, um, the effectiveness against B1617.2 is only 33%, 34% against B1617.2. And so this is problematic because a lot of countries in Europe were only pushing that first dose. And even in the United States, there are millions of people who never went back for their second dose. Um, and so the fact that it's only 33.5% protective against symptoms from B1617.2 is, is problematic. Uh, but even worse is that that means that there are asymptomatic P, uh, infections. And if this is protection against symptoms, you know that there, it's a, even worse that there's a lot of people who are going to still be infected. And that means that there's going to still continue to be transmission, even with the vaccines that might be prob uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. So um, luckily, we know that Moderna, Pfizer, the other vaccine companies are looking at booster shots and they're really going to be optimizing. We still have many months to prepare 
for fall and winter coming. So hopefully they'll, they'll be, be able to identify a, a more optimized booster if, if necessary. Uh, they're they're going to continue to be looking at this uh, over the next three to five months. Um, and so if necessary, we'll be able to get a booster to bump these numbers up more specifically for B1617.2 or if other variants emerge over the over our summer um, that we need to be concerned about uh, next fall and winter. So so this is it. For, but but I mean, so so the, the big takeaway, this, this should put people's mind at ease. The big takeaway for people who are vaccinated is that 80% protection from, from symptoms is huge. It's not too different from, from what we're seeing from the other variants. So this is really, really good news. It's going to keep a lot of people out of the hospital and it's gonna prevent a lot of deaths among people who are vaccinated. There, it's not gonna prevent all the deaths or prevent all the symptoms among vaccinated people. There still will be people who are vaccinated and who end up in the hospital and who uh, die, but it's gonna be a lot less than the unvaccinated. However, we see this major difference between one dose versus two, and the major the major worry now is, is the unvaccinated. There are a lot of people in the country still who are unvaccinated, and, and that's going to be problematic. All right, back to you. All right, should that's really interesting as well, Glenn. Should kids in school still continue wearing masks in the fall? All right, so let's see what we have there. All right, so um, there's been some recent uh, investigations. Well, there's been a lot of investigations looking at how safe it is for kids to attend school. And, what, and we found that being in school almost across the board, and not just in the United States, but globally, is safer for kids than being home for a bunch of reasons, but um, I think that one of the main, pardon me, one of the main reasons is that I think the parents might let their guards down when they're at home, whereas when the kids go to school, they tend to wear the masks. So now the big question is gonna be, um, can the kids go to school without the masks? Because now, I mean, we've just entered, we're entering the summer, everyone's perception is that COVID-19 is over. And right now it's shifting to the politics now. Um, and so the politics, you, it's, that's a different, that's a different field. Epidemiologists cannot predict the politics. And so we don't know what's going to happen with the politics. Um, but most likely based on what I just shared with you in the fall and winter, we're going to need to, to have the mask mandates brought back again. Um, the question is when, I don't know. Um, but, but what we found in, um, so, so I'll, I'll go switch to the punchline here. The punchline is that um, the incidence rates of COVID-19 was 37% lower uh, in schools that required teacher and staff to use masks versus those that just gave them the option to use masks. Um, so the mandates made a difference versus the option to wear masks. Um, one thing that was interesting here is this. So this is um, the, the mask requirements for teachers and staff this means that it's uh, around 37%, so 0 0.63 is relative to one, it means that it's 37% um, effective at uh, spread in the classrooms if the teachers or staff, so the adults, if they wore masks. Interestingly, when they had the kids wear masks, the effect wasn't nearly as strong. And the reason for this, like I mentioned before, is that kids, they, they have an R of one, a reproductive rate of one for the virus, and so the, the virus just doesn't spread very well uh, from kids. It's mostly e most easily spread from adults. So it's important that the adults wear the mask. For the kids, it didn't even reach statistical significance. It looked like there maybe was a trend possibly for reduction in spread if the kids wore the masks, but it really wasn't even statistically significant for the sample size, which means that it's way more important that the teachers and staff wear masks than the kids do. Um, but, but the kids, there, there might be this additional benefit. The other thing is when they were looking in this study at, um, at air filtration. Um, so for instance, there were two options. One was to open doors, open windows and use or use fans. And this was called the dilution method. The other was filtration, filtration using HEPA filters. And that was filtration or purification. And then the, the third option was both of them together. 
So opening the doors and windows, putting on the fans, and also having a HEPA filter. Clearly, the HEPA filter was most, uh, the, the combination of all of them was most effective with a 48% lower incidence. However, the vast majority of the benefit was found simply by dilution alone, simply by opening the doors, opening the windows, or using fans or, or doing all of that had almost as much benefit as having the HEPA, uh, the HEPA filter there as well. So um, with minimal effort, it's not like this is a huge investment that most uh, schools would need to do. Simply turning, uh, turning on the fans, opening the windows, opening the doors uh, is really powerful way, uh, independent of the mask wearing to reduce the, the incidence. So uh, as an epidemiologist, I would say, yes, given the evidence, all the faculty and staff come fall and winter need to be wearing masks. That needs to be mandated everywhere. Uh, who knows what'll happen? Because that's again, a political issue. Uh, but, and the kids probably should be too, uh, but there's not as much evidence to support that. Uh, but in addition, at least as important is this idea of, of uh, the cross ventilation, having the doors and windows open and, uh, and if, if possible, having HEPA filters in, in there as well. But you know, a lot of what we did over the last year that we've talked about was sort of um, hygiene theater um, where we didn't even know. So at the beginning we were just uh, washing everything and we were putting alcohol on things and, and that kind of stuff really didn't have as much benefit as wearing the masks and, and keeping the, the, the air flowing and keeping the windows open. So, so now we're finding, we're, we're really getting a better understanding of what really matters. And so really, uh, it's it, it, some some counties are, are spending millions of dollars on these like really advanced uh, airflow systems, and that really doesn't give you as much benefit as simply opening the window or or, do, or wearing the masks when you look at this. So if if there's a limited budget to spend on this, um, maybe not spending it on some of these respiratory uh, enhancements. Uh, there might be better things that it, it can be spent on. All right, back to you. Okay. I saw there was a question. Um, so this, the question was on the severity of the um, the B six one B one six one seven point two. So right now it's hard to know. Um, there is limited evidence. In fact, let me go back to that for a second. So I was looking at the case fatality rate, and was it here? So. I forget if it was here. I think it was in UK. The, the thing is, I don't know that I trust the, the, um, the, um, the case fatality rate information right now, simply because of the seasonality of the year. One of the things that we learned going in, in fact, let me, I'll bring up the data just so we can show it, is this, is this uh, uh, chart. So as we go into the summer seasons here, there's less transmission of the virus. So even if people get sick, there's less transmission. And if there's less transmission, <clears throat> that means for a lot of people, the inoculation dose, the dose when they first get infected will have less virus in it for a lot of people, which means that this, that in and of itself will make symptoms lower. And, and, that mean, and that in and of itself is probably one of the reasons that the case fatality rate in the United States came down in the summer. During the summer, we started realizing there were better treatments. And that's when we started using the cortical steroids and we started using some of these other things like dexamethasone and some of these other things. Um, but early on, I think that it was largely a seasonal thing. Um, and so, so I don't know if I trust it. So far, it does not seem to be as severe as the UK variant. But again, I don't know if I, the evidence in terms of what that's looking like, I don't know how much we can trust it. But just in terms of the data that we see, and let me see if I can find it. Was it here that I was looking at? I, I yeah, I'm not gonna be able to pull a lot of uh, just uh, right now. But basically what we were looking at was um, it's, so, so right now the interim data is suggesting that the case fatality rate might be a little lower but again, I don't know that I trust the data just because of the seasonality, because of the, the way that the studies are being conducted. I don't think that they're accurately estimating yet. We'll, we'll know mo more over the next few months, particularly as we look at the behavior in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the Southern Hemisphere has been really hit hard. And you would think that because they've been hit so hard, that it's just people have been infected 
and the numbers should start coming down at some point. Um, so, so this is going to be the test. All right, back to you. Okay. Glenn, can you tell us, is it okay to mix and match the vaccines? Say you got the AstraZeneca vaccine for a first dose. Can you get the Pfizer vaccine as a second dose? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so there have been a couple of studies looking at this. One of the reasons that people have been very interested in this question is um, there was this blood clot. It was a very, very, very rare risk of this very specific type of blood clot that we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, it was seen both in the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, both of those use the adenovirus as the vector for it. And it's still very rare that both of those vaccines increase the risk of its, that this very specific type of clot is called CVSC. It's not clots in general, just this very specific kind. It increases the risk by around one in a million. So it's, it's less than the risk of getting struck by lightning or it's really, really low. Um, however, because there was this risk identified, oh, and by the way, it was not, so it was investigated after we found it in those two vaccines, it was heavily investigated in Moderna and in Pfizer's vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, and there was not the same issue there. Those that we have not found any severe risk in those mRNA vaccines. As a result, there's a lot of interest now in Europe uh, Canada, some other countries that first use the AstraZeneca vaccine, they need a second dose in that using AstraZeneca. Johnson & Johnson was only intended to be a one-dose vaccine. The AstraZeneca is a two-dose vaccine. Most of them only got the one dose, like I mentioned. So the question now is, for the second dose, should they, should they take the AstraZeneca vaccine again, or should they take the Pfizer mRNA vaccine as the second one? Um, let me put people on mute. All right, sorry about that. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. All right. All right, there we go. So, um, so what we're looking at here is some studies that were done looking at what happens if you start with the AstraZeneca vaccine as the first dose, and then you switch to the mRNA vaccine as the second dose. All right, so um, a couple of countries have started looking at this. The UK has, has been very interested, so they've done some studies on this. Um, and this is consistent with what we're seeing in UK, but right now what I'm showing you, sharing with you is I think uh, what was done in Spain. Um, I think that's what we're looking at. And so, yeah, so, so um, this was the Spanish uh, Combiv uh, Combivax trial, uh, this, the number wasn't very high, but so it, it limits our ability to see rare, really rare problems. But at a high level, what this, what this trial was looking at and the one in the UK we're looking at that are both reaching similar conclusions so far is simply whether you would get the same relative amount of immune protection in terms of looking at antibodies, whether the, the, the uh, side effect profile was the same when you get the shots, et cetera. And what they found is that this, the, uh, having the mRNA vaccine as the second dose was totally fine so far. So all the preliminary evidence is suggesting that it's totally fine to mix and match, starting with AstraZeneca, then going to the Pfizer vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. Um, and so this one was, um, was in uh, in Spain, um, and so it. Although it was looked like it was um, so small numbers, looking at six, sixty three. Uh, the UK variant, the UK uh, uh, trial was very was, was similar, um, and so so yes, the preliminary evidence is right now suggesting that it is okay. We're we're still the, the countries are going to have to decide what they want to do and what they recommend. We don't have data in tens of thousands of people or millions of people. So we don't know for sure. Um, but right now the preliminary evidence is suggesting that it's okay. Okay. Glenn, do you have any updates on vaccine hesitancy? What can we do to get more adults vaccinated over the summer? Yeah, so this was a study that was conducted by the New York Times that some people have been talking about. And so I thought it was really well done. So the, the approach that they use is very common 
in business marketing and also in the pharmaceutical industry uh, when we're trying to identify uh, among different disease uh, diseases, the people who have those diseases, what types of, of characteristics do they have? And can you group the characteristics into types of people? So we call this sort of segments of people uh, that, you, that might share different characteristics that you can sort of think about them as sort of having this common set of experiences or common set of, of characteristics. And the New York Times took this approach. So the segmentation sort of, we sometimes call it in epidemiology doing cluster analyses and really trying to identify these segments. So when you look at this, there are, they found that there were basically four different kinds of, of segments, four different kinds of clusters, four different types of, of kinds of people in terms of what's holding them back from getting vaccinated. And it's interesting, what's most useful about this is that how we respond to them is going to be different. So vaccine hesitancy isn't just one thing. We need, need to really think about it as four different kinds of people. These are the most common that we found. The four common were watchful. So around 8% of people say they just want to wait and see. So hopefully in the next couple of months, uh, they'll see that, that the vaccines are continuing to be safe and effective. And so they'll now have the opportunity. And so for them, well, the, the, uh, the best strategy may be to help them see how many people have been vaccinated and how safe it is. The next set are cost anxious. So as we've been talking about previously, even though the vaccines are free for everyone to take globally, because it's the insurance companies and the tax dollars that are paying for it. So even though they're free to the patients, to the people taking it, um, the problem is we've all been talking about these side effects. You know, after the first dose, and particularly after the second dose, a lot of people who get these vaccines are maybe knocked off their feet for 24 hours or so. They might have fevers, they might feel ill, they might just want to stay in bed. And so that 24 hour period after they get say the second dose, uh, but also for the first dose for some people, um, that's tough for people who need to work. If people are in lower income positions and they can't, they don't have vacation days or they can't afford to take off, then those people do have costs even though the vaccine itself is free. And so this is a legitimate concern for why they don't wanna get vaccinated because they can't afford to get vaccinated and miss work for that 24 hour or longer period. So this is something that we might need to uh, address in the states in which it's occurring. The next is system distrusters. So luckily only 4% of Americans say that the reason that they're not getting the vaccine is because they just don't trust the, the, vaccine, the, the vaccine manufacturers and they don't trust the government. So it's not the case that the majority of these, of these vaccine hesitant people just don't believe the vaccine uh, uh, and, they don't, uh, and the, the manufacturers and they don't believe the government. Um, these people, this 4% are just not trusting the system. So that's one type of thing we're gonna have to address for those people. Finally, are the COVID skeptics. So this is a really weird group, okay? COVID skeptics are people who don't believe that COVID itself is anything to worry about. And so they believe that because COVID-19 is nothing to worry about, then why bother even getting the vaccine? Because it's just like another annual flu. Is that, and, and where did they hear this from? From the previous president, Trump, Trump, President Trump. This was what he constantly kept on drilling in. COVID is not a serious disease. Take off the masks, get back to work. That was the main thing. And a lot of people have taken this to, how, to heart. 14% is what we're looking at. The interesting thing about this is once you develop these four segments, you see that there's tremendous variation across the country and where they're falling. They are not equally distributed. So for instance, the first one, let's start with the COVID skeptics. You see that the COVID skeptics, so, so the way to look at this is the black box is the average rate across the United, State as a, the United States as a whole. If the red dot, the pink dot in here is less than the black box, then that means that there's far, far less in that state. So for instance, Vermont has far, far less COVID skeptics than the national average. The national average was the black box and they are very, very small. In contrast, Arkansas is huge. There are way more COVID skeptics in Arkansas than there are for the national average. 
And you see that there's regional variation in terms of where the skepticism is occurring. So generally, I mean, just at, the, at a high level, frankly, we've talked about red states and blue states. I, I didn't do an overlay here, but you can see that we're looking at the South here. We're looking at uh, the, mid, the, the, the Midwest here. Generally, the red states are the ones where there's a lot of COVID skepticism. The Northeast, the West Coast, there's less so. Um, and so this, is, this means that our uh, communication is going to need to change on a regional or state-by-state -state level in terms of how we're addressing these people. And we, we do have a bunch of months to work with, okay? Cold, flu, COVID season isn't really gonna start hitting us until around September, October. Um, and so we do have some months to work with. The, the, the big wild card here, the uncertainty, is what this summer looks like. We did have that second surge in the South last summer. Maybe we'll have a small surge, uh, hopefully not too big this summer. We don't know yet, but certainly in the fall and winter, or, or almost certainly in the fall and winter, there will be another large surge. And that's really the big one we're going to have to be preparing for now. And that's why these messages are going to be so important. The next, when we talk about the cost anxious, you see that there's a lot of variation there as well. This is really hitting the South hard. So we saw Arkansas was the big one for the COVID disbelievers, but now Mississippi is hugely standing out in terms of the cost anxious. So we need different strategies for getting these people vaccinated. Because when you compare Mississippi here, you see that Mississippi, when it comes to COVID skepticism, is just right at the national average. So that's, that's not much worse than the national average because it is the national average. But when you look at what's really driving Mississippi from not getting vaccinated, they are worried about cost. They just cannot afford to take a day or two off with the, with the potential side effects of the vaccine. So this is, a, and this is an addressable thing. Now that we know this, this is something we can address. So this is public health 101. This is the way that, that, this, that this is done. So it's really great news. Here, now we're looking at system distrusters. Remember, this was only 4%. So it was a small overall percentage of people who were, the, of what was driving it. But here you see that what's really, the people who really just don't trust the system at all, this is largely coming out of Georgia, so much of the South, but it shifted a lot. You see that New Jersey, New York, uh, we're seeing some more of that here, Maryland, you see that the states have, have shifted some. The responses for how to address system distrusters is a little bit different. And so this, this requires some different messaging and whatnot. Uh, finally, the last one here are the watchful. So they represent around 8% globally, or 8% nationally, rather. Um, and you see that this varies too. Whereas before you saw Arkansas was much more heavy for the first set that we were talking about, the COVID skeptics. Mississippi, it was a real driver for, for the cost. Um, and New Jersey and some others really didn't trust the system as much, Georgia in particular. Now here, when you look at the watchful, the ones who are waiting to see what happens uh, in terms of the vaccine, is it safe? Is it really now, after all these months, do we still think the vaccines are so important? These watchful people, it shifted even more. This we're finding more in Delaware, Rhode Island, uh, Oklahoma, some of these others in Florida. So over the next few months, this is uh, the, the messaging. You'll find that the messaging changes. So depending on what state you live in, you might hear different things on commercials, on social media that might be more specific to the types of worry that's been, that's been identified in these states. And so really interesting stuff. Um, that's where we are so far. Okay. Is it a good idea to continue doing asymptomatic surveillance testing over the summer? Uh, so that, that's another question that comes in periodically uh, that just came in again. So let me, let me talk about this. Here's a refresher. We've, we talked about this a bunch. Well, we've talked about this a few times over the last, uh, over the last year. Uh, and, and over the last few months, we've talked about it as well. The false positive rate, how do we calculate it? So um, what you can think about is that there's a, uh, uh, the true uh, condition in terms of whether people actually have the virus or no virus. And then you have what the test says. If the test says it's positive or the test says it's negative. And so because of this, you can do a two by two table. Green is when you actually have the virus or a person actually has the virus and the test comes back positive, or if the person truly does not have the virus and the test comes back negative. 
and, and vice versa, you can have the test come back positive when there's actually no virus, that's a false positive, or the test can come back negative when there really is a virus, and that's a false negative. We have problems with both false positives and false negatives, and so that's an issue that's come up. However, the big question here is the false positive rate. Now, one thing that we talked about is that there's these things, I'm not going to revisit this right now, sensitivity and specificity, but basically, in terms of the accuracy of the test, no test in existence is 100% accurate. That means no test gets every single one of these boxes right, where all of the boxes are either true positive or true negative. There are always some false positives and always some false negatives in every test in existence. There's not a, a no test that's 100% accurate. And so as a result, um, these things are, are called the sensitivity and the specificity. They're, they're measures of test accuracy. And so what happens is, as the total number of true cases goes down, so that the prevalence rate, that's the red box here, is the prevalence rate goes down, simply by having less cases, it means that because you have a ton of tests that are out there, but hardly any actual true cases, so here you have very, very, very few true cases. Because the there's so many tests, that means you start to accumulate a lot of these false positives. And so the reality is you start ending up with a lot of false positives and the false positive rate gets enormous. So over the summer, you might have in many places, it could easily occur where because the prevalence rate is so, so small in so many places, if we continue doing these tests for asymptomatic people, then you could end up with the false positive rate easily being above 80%, above 90%, where 90% of the people who get a test who end up with a positive result, it could be that 90% of them are, are, are false positives. And that really at that point almost becomes counterproductive. We're in the summer season, uh, the spread, the transmission is going to be really, really low. We're not in, in the Northern hemisphere. We, we need to really be paying close attention to the prevalence in local areas. And it's, it's probably just a waste over the next few months uh, to really be spending much money on these tests, frankly. Uh, I know a lot of businesses and, and other places are gonna still continue to do it, but what we're gonna find is a lot of false positives. So um, that, that's gonna be a challenging thing. I think we have time for, for maybe one more question. I was um, just going to say that. Okay, let's hear one more then. Is it true that some people who are vaccinated for COVID-19 can still get severely sick and die from COVID-19? How do we know if we are still at risk after getting vaccinated? Is this something we need to be concerned about? Yeah, so so this is definitely, I think I shared this uh couple of weeks ago, I don't recall exactly this, but let me bring it up because the questions are risen again. Um, so basically, here's an example. This was a, in Kentucky, uh, um, a skilled nursing facility. So essentially a, a nursing home, a long-term care facility um, where there was the index case was one person who was first sick. Um, this person I believe was unvaccinated. The first person was sick. This was a staff person who was sick. They were symptomatic. They went into work. And, um, and they infected other people. On the left, these were all the unvaccinated people. And on the right, these were the vaccinated people. You can see that there were a lot of staff who were unvaccinated still at that point. And there were only a handful of, um, of the residents that were unvaccinated. In contrast, the vast majority of, of residents had been vaccinated and maybe half of the staff had been vaccinated, a little bit more than half of the staff had been vaccinated. All right, so what did we find? We found in this example, so this study, that virtually every single uh, 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 resident who was not vaccinated ended up getting symptoms. So not, not everyone, it turned it was 75%, so the attack rate was 75%, but this was among the people unvaccinated, the fact that so many people got infected and that so many people got symptoms is astonishing. The symptoms, the, the blue were, the, were people who are asymptomatic. So, so all of these people, the, the symptom rate was 63% and the death rate among the unvaccinated was 25%, all right? 
In contrast, among the residents who were vaccinated, you see that a lot, because so many people were vaccinated, you still had a lot of people who got infected. The blue were asymptomatic, the yellow were symptomatic, and the red was uh, someone who died. So as a whole, the symptomatic rate was tremendously less. So we went from a, 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 an attack rate of 75%. So of all the people who were, who were unvaccinated, 75% got infected. In contrast, among the vaccinated, only 25% got infected. Even better, even the, the unvaccinated, even though 63% were symptomatic, only 8%, 9, 8 to 9% were symptomatic about, uh, among the vaccinated. So the vaccines worked amazingly well. The death rate among the unvaccinated was 25% and the death rate was only one to 2%. There was only one person. So at that point it gets hard to know exactly what it was, but only one person died. So that's roughly, let's say one to 2% of this population died. What this means is that the vaccines are hugely, hugely protective. Everyone needs to get vaccinated. But what it also means is that there will be people who are vaccinated who despite the vaccine still get infected. That's the blue. It's not everyone, it's tremendous, tremendous, tremendous protection, but there will still be a sizable number of people who are vaccinated and get infected, but they're gonna be asymptomatic. Some of these asymptomatic can spread it to other people. And so we need to be wearing back, uh, masks come fall and winter. There will be a lot of people uh, who are symptomatic. So here we're looking at eight to 9% of vaccinated. In this case, it could be something similar uh, when we, when we uh, hit fall and winter. Eight to 9%, if we have 200 million people vaccinated, 10% of that is 20 million people. And so we're really looking about a lot of symptomatic people who are, are symptomatic with COVID, even though they were vaccinated. And yet, Here's one person that still died from COVID-19, even though they received the full dose of the vaccine. And so that means there will be people who are vaccinated with COVID, the, the COVID-19 vaccines who will die in the fall and winter from COVID-19. These vaccines are amazing, but they are not perfect. They do not make us invulnerable. And so this is something to continue to keep in mind. Everyone needs to get vaccinated the more unvaccinated, not only is the are the vaccines really, really critical for the unvaccinated to protect them, but it also reduces transmission and will reduce the risk that even of having index cases starting outbreaks like this. And it's the reason that we need to get people vaccinated. But, but I, I keep on stressing this, everyone who's vaccinated, this does not mean you are invulnerable. You don't have, a, a, this doesn't give you license to just go out right now during the summer, it's not seasonal. It's this, this is the time to go out and enjoy your lives. Be uh, uh, cautious, take, but, but spend the time outdoors, spend the time with friends and family. But when fall and winter comes back, we will not be invulnerable. Even with the booster shot, there is still gonna be a symptom, a, an attack rate and an infection rate. There is still gonna be a symptomatic rate and there is still gonna be a death rate. And so we still have to take precautions and be wise about this. Okay. Great. Thank you, thank you, Glenn. All right, so now that it's it's around the time that we need to close this, this session, um, did you want to repeat again when you're going to be having your next session? Yeah, and that's right. So we're, we're taking off for Memorial Day weekend this coming week. In two weeks, we'll, re we'll come back here. And then I think over the summer, I think we'll move to a schedule of every other week, just because that'll be a little bit easier with summer calendars. I'll be able to enjoy my weekend a little bit more and others will too. I don't expect that there'll be a lot of information coming. If we find that there's just tons of weird information coming over the summer, we can switch back to every weekend. But for the time being, I'll just assume it's gonna be every other weekend starting Memorial Day. Um, and, and so we'll be skipping next weekend, Memorial Day. Same time, same place. Same so. time, same place. Perfect. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you.